50 last time round. Russell Ingle did half a second quicker than Mark Scaife. So Ingle really starting to turn it up now. This is the rear view from the Mobile HRT Commodore, the sole remaining Mobile HRT Commodore. The pitch is coming to you from windscreens O'Brien. Here's Mark Scaife at the wheel. Two times Bathurst champ. We're coming up towards the two hour mark. Lap 51 of 161, 110 laps still remain. Mark Scaife at the wheel of 05. He's done a tremendous job throughout the week as he did the Tickford 500 coming aboard. The Mobile Holden dealer team for the Tickford 500 to stand down, put the car on pole position. It's been scintillating throughout qualifying. And that's actually the uh, Skippy Parsons in the forward credit Falcon behind him, so he's actually gone oh, a lap down. He's got a problem. He's got a problem. I just thought he yep. had a drama there. He's slowing down. David Parsons went past him there. Looked like he's fiddling around with the gear change. Yeah, that car is slowing. Boy, oh boy, I know how they feel. Well, it's all turning to disaster for Holden Racing Team. You can hear something broke. And here comes Larry Perkins uh, just coming up behind him now to sort of take the lead of the race. You heard like a bang or a clang or something in the car. Escape is accelerating up Mountain Straight. He'll be busily talking to his crew. And here comes our new race leader, Russell Ingle, on the attack. There he goes. And Ingle takes the lead of the Primus 1000 Classic. 05 is in big trouble. Wow. This is just unbelievable. An unbelievable day for Holden Racing Team. They've had lost two cars. Bargwana and Noski went out before the race even started. Lowndes and Murphy went out after Craig clouded the wall at the top of the mountain. And then now Mark Scape has a problem with the 05 HRT Commodore. Some of those 15 and 20 to ones are looking pretty good at the TAB, I'd say. <laughs> Goodness me, this is a cruel place, Dick Johnson. You felt the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. It really can deal it out, can't it? It certainly can, and uh, for some reason we just keep coming back for more. <laughs> Addicted to it. Well, there'll be some long faces down to the Holden Racing Team. This is a major embarrassment for the works team. There's Greg Murphy. Just cannot believe it. Because the whole team would be feeling the same way. That body language, the picture tells a thousand words. That's it. Three cars started, three, two are out. And looks like the third one. Well, it looks at this point in time that unfortunately Peter Brock uh, won't get his tenth win at Bathurst, unfortunately. I'd love to know what went on in that car, Dick Johnson. There's some sort of a bang or a clung as he was coming up Mount, Mountain Straight and then Mark Scaife, you could just see it was all over. Well, it's, it's very difficult to say at this point in time, but you know, it, it could be something uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably small and they may be able to get the car back out again. But uh, when you hear a bang like that, it's always something wrong with the gearbox or something like that breaks. Just noticed that shot too, the second place car, Neil Crompton just swept past to take second place in the race. So this car now running third on the road, but he's got to bring it into pit lane. And as you say, Dick, it may not be terminal. There may be some problem they can fix. Well, it is still running, and there's certainly no smoke or anything coming out. So Let's hope, let's uh, not get too carried away too early. Let's cross our fingers and hope that uh, Mark Scaife and Peter Brock can continue to give Brock every possible chance of winning that tenth. That now elevates Charlie O'Brien in the Longhurst Castrol Ford up into a top three position. So we continue that from 39th up to third. John Smiles. Scaife arrives in the pits, wisps of smoke from underneath. Jeff Brett was just asked by one of the team members, should they put the car straight away or should they bring it into pit row? He said, you may as well bring it in here, but uh, he didn't sound too happy about it. They're putting the bonnet down. It is genuinely an engine problem. It is genuinely at the back of the car. They're going for the fire extinguishers. Extinguishers on it. Ron Harrop bring Mark Scaife out of the car. Scaife got to say but he's still there the smoke's going into the car from the uh, front of the fire extinguishers they're not even going to take the engine covers off to have a look underneath it as far as they're concerned it's a push away job and 05 at 1203 is out of the primus 1000 at least at the moment i mean who knows when they get it back maybe they can do something with it well look at poor mark he's just he would just be devastated that's just so sad. Not even two hours into the Primus 1000 Classic and all three Mobile HRT cars are out of this race. Well, I just imagine all those hundreds of rock banners around the track. Huge crowd in here cheering him on. There'll be a collective sigh, a groan around Mount Panorama now. 05 in the pits and doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Three Holton Racing Team cars started. None are finished. So your updated order is uh, the 05 car is going to get pushed back into the pit garage. It stands like this. Ingle, Crompton, Charlie O'Brien, 
Scott Pruitt, Jimmy Richards, Andrew Medici, David Parsons, Wynn Percy, Darren Hossack and Tony Scott in the top ten. When you look at it, they've really had uh, quite a few uh, unfortunate uh, reliability problems this year. You're right, Dick. I mean, there's the shot. Mark Scape wiping the sweat from his face. Rock, it. Rock did a fantastic job in the early stages of that race. Uh, you know, he, he'd been sort of unindated with people all week and really couldn't get his head around it, but he certainly got his head around it this morning. Let's go to John Smales, who's with Mark Scape. Mark Scape, just a huge disappointment. What happened? Just had a, like a flame out uh, up Mountain Straight, John, and all of a sudden, bad misfire back on seven cylinders for some, for some reason. We don't know yet. And um, obviously, I battled to get it back, so the boys left to have a look. Are you talking about terminal at this stage, mate? Honestly, we don't know, mate. I mean, we haven't looked at it properly yet to, to ascertain that. Peter Brock, your feelings at this time? Well, uh, that's motor racing. I mean, you know full well when you embark on this whole business of going into motor race that you can go through the highs and lows. And, uh, I mean, we had a magnificent run thus far, just running absolutely beautifully. And, uh... I guess that if you've looked at one perspective, well, the fans were uh, treated to something there for a couple, for an hour or two, you know, and uh, but to come back from here will be uh, pretty well impossible, I guess. The emotions, Peter? Well, I, I, I really have none of it as we speak, to be honest with you. I'm just sort of sitting here going, hey, this has happened to me before. Been in a good spot. Uh, I suppose. Uh, in a, you know, as a, as the race unfolds, we, you know, you can start to see that uh, there was it was there to be had. You're probably feeling pretty uh, pretty flat about it all. That's motor racing, guys. It's not a bad epitaph, is it? Well, a really sad day, and uh, well, that sign says it all. Brocky, we'll miss you. We certainly will, and we certainly didn't want to see uh, a great career end this way. We'll be back on the other side of this break with a full race update. thousand classic updates brought to you by armor all welcome back well the second hour of this race started friendly enough greg murphy giving larry perkins a wave as he tried to squeeze by he did manage to get into second but take a look at this for one of the most spectacular crashes you'll ever see at the mountain thomas mazira putting a real heavy fall into the sand as he came out of caltech's chase as i said a spectacular crash but thankfully amid all that dust amid all that ruin Thomas Mazira did manage to escape unharmed. Alan Jones led the charge into the pits. This was the first of the scheduled pit changes and Scott Pruitt from the Indy cars stepped into the car. The Mobile Herald Holden uh, racing team cars also went into the pits and Mark Scaife assumed the seat in the 05. Big trouble again for the Shell Helix racing team. Stephen Johnson this time with a smoky car in the pits. He managed to get back into the race. But would you believe that this happened to the Mobile racing team yet again? This is the 1-5 Commodore and Craig Lowndes with Greg Murphy. Craig Lowndes in the seat at this stage just tried to get around a back marker and put it into the wall. Absolutely devastating way to end the Primus 1000 Classic. Of course, Lowndes and Murphy won Sandown and Bathurst last year. They won Sandown this year, but they just couldn't manage to repeat it. There were three mobile Holden Commodores that started this race. That left one. And Bill Woods, well, really, we didn't know what was to come next because it was just heartbreaking. Yes, Matthew White, incredible circumstances here, but the crowd has their collective heads bowed right now because the 05 is also out of the race, a disastrous day for HRT, and literally tears being shed in the pits right now from the team members. This is the new race leader, Russell Ingle, as we look back at a disconsolate Mark Scaife, and I'm sure there's a tear or two in those eyes as well. Ingle in front of Neil Crompton in the Donut King Commodore, taking over from Wayne Gardner, of course. The co-drive there, another nice piece of co-driving from Charlie O'Brien to put the Longhurst Falcon on provisional pole right now. The safety car is out. We'll just quickly tell you that Scott Pruitt's in fourth in the Komatsu Falcon ahead of Jimmy Richards and Andrew Medecki. Then David Parsons in seventh, but Russell Ingle has just lapped the Ford Credit Falcon of David Parsons. So that gives you an idea of how far ahead he is right now as we return to pace car and an incredibly dramatic Primus 1000 Classic after only 56 laps. Well, the safety car is out on the circuit and this is the reason why. Let's have a look at the slow-mo replay of the incident that caused it. Andrew Medici coming up the inside of the Cotter Dulman. Allen's Commodore and Medici gets sideways. Whether they, yes, there was contact there. And 
John Cotter just goes spinning off into the sand. And Madiki looks like he was able to get out of that. Here's the angle from up pit straight. They go spinning side by side. Cotter was uh, unable to pull it up before he went into the sand and he wasn't getting out of there in a hurry. That's why the safety car is out. They're going to have to pull him out of the sand. Well, they certainly are. It was a fairly ambitious move, I must admit, from uh, Medecki to sort of try and... He obviously just locked his rear brakes uh, as he was going down uh, underneath uh, Doolan there and, and uh, obviously contact. And unfortunately, it's put the, the, the privateer, who was running extremely well, uh, obviously a fair way back because they'll have to pull him out of the sand. Interesting thing here, Dick, is we're getting up to lap 56. That's coming up towards your scheduled second stop, so maybe we'll see a rash of pit stops peeling off the pace car. Well, it, it just depends. I think it'll be a very smart move. Well, you know, I'm sort of tactically saying from uh, from our point of view what we would do. We would, if we were in the lead at that point in time, we would straight away go ahead and uh, and pull the car in, and uh, because you've got to make a compulsory four stops, you've got to make a pad change. And a pad change under pace car right, would be a lot, the, uh, lot quicker. Slow boat, but both, uh, both levers hard forward is full soft and right back to full hard, is that right? David Parsons talking to Tony Murphy, team manager for the Ford Credit team. We will endeavour to make contact with David. David Parsons, it's Lee Diffie in the commentary. Can you hear us, mate? Perhaps still making communications with Tony Murphy. We're under safety car conditions and David Parsons and the Ford Credit team aren't in the best of positions at the moment because unfortunately Skippy has just gone one lap down. Russell Ingle was able to work his way past. That's something you just don't want to do is, uh, you know, with these pace car situations, uh, you really got to fight for the lead as long as you possibly can to stop yourself going a lap down. See, Parsons really was fighting with Ingle too when he was trying to put that lap on him because he probably knew with all those wrecks lying around the circuit it was only a matter of time before that safety car came out and he was going to get pinned in the lineup. It'd be interesting to see how many people actually, or how many of the guys actually come in and do a pad change everything because there's enough now to go straight to the end with two stops and, and there's a compulsory four stop rule in this race so uh, if it was me I'd be sort of heading into the pits because it's getting very close to the second stop. Let's go down to Bill Woods, he's with Peter Brock. Yes, thank you, Lee. Well, Brocky, uh, well, there's really nothing I can say, but I'm sure that uh, the whole of Australia right now is feeling for you. What are you feeling? Well, I know that motor racing is just one of the weirdest sports you'll ever choose to uh, partake in in your life. I've been through the highs and lows of it all, and I guess after a while you uh, just tend to roll with it a bit. The car was running magnificently, uh, I suppose, from one perspective, to have gotten out there uh, early on that race and to have led uh, the first stint was uh, something which I'll never forget. I mean, it was a thoroughly enjoyable uh, situation. The car was running beautifully. Uh, Mark drove it along. It looks like it's had a fl massive flame out in the airbox and actually set fire to the, uh, the uh, fuel injection system and what have you under the bonnet. So uh, it's a rather remarkable situation. We haven't seen it before. Well, it's been what a troubled camera? year, really, mechanically. I mean, obviously, Murphy and Lowndes did well to take sand down, but you had your problems there as well, you and Scafie. Yeah. So... Uh, it's been a tough end of this career. Yes, it has, and uh, you know you can't. You know, not every week you're going to go out there and be a winner. I tried to explain it to young uh, Jason Bagwana before. They, uh, you know, they can get their eyeballs spinning a bit with like saying win, win, win. So no, look, you've just got to be enthusiastic, enjoy the moment out there, and uh, just take it as it comes. I mean, some days it's your day, some days it's not. Well, Dickie Johnson, of course, has had similar troubles today, but Dick, of course, could look forward to next year. He's up in the commentary box right now, and. Uh, Dick, is there anything you'd like to say to Brocky at this stage? Uh, because uh, he has nothing uh, nothing much to look forward to over the next 100 or so laps. Well, congratulations, Brocky. Uh, you've had a fantastic career. And uh, I know damn well that uh, you, you gave it your best shot today, mate. You did a fantastic job. And uh, and you've done a lot for motor racing over the years. So all the best, pal. Thanks, Dickie. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, just saying to Scafe a minute ago there that uh, he said, mate, I was terrific out there this morning. I was getting out the traffic. I was driving like a kid, Dickie. So there's uh, maybe there's a couple of years in you yet. Well, I'm sure there is, pal, but you've made the decision. You know, it's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, I'd like to see you around for a few few more years because uh, I certainly haven't finished yet, but uh, probably later on in the day I'll have a, a, a cup of lemon tea with you or something. Thanks, Dickie. Yeah, look, I, it's, a, it's a tough sport, as I was saying a minute ago, and uh, 
I seem to remember the first 10 years or so of your uh, racing career. You had uh, some uh, tremendous challenges to overcome, but you did that, and it's a cre absolute credit to you. Well, it's just great to be part of it with you, pal. Thank you, Dickie. I think if we gave Dick a few more minutes, mate, he might talk you to a comeback. Uh, no, 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 no. I think I mean, I, I um, have loved the sport. I love the mountain here. I mean, what a magnificent crowd. They've come to say farewell, and that's really what they have done. What are you going to do for the next 100 or so laps? Well, I don't know. I might. Uh, I think the, we'll get the car going again, and uh, I'm determined we're going to get the car going again because I want to finish off the end of this race. I don't care how many laps down we are, uh, and do those farewell laps. Uh, and as Scapey just said before, let's go out there and go feral. Let's go out there and really give it to it. Just, just have some fun. So it'll be a bit like Sandown was. That was memorable. Yes, it was. And uh, as far as uh, we're concerned, look, motor racing is entertainment, and. Uh, for all those people who've come along to the racetrack, for all those people who've tuned into the 10 network to have a bit of a look, you know, I just hope you've enjoyed the day's activities. It's not over yet. It's a very exciting, unpredictable sport. Well, it's fantastic news because I don't think the crowd here realises that you can get that car back on the road. Let's hope that does happen and that they at least get to see you go around because I think they'd be pretty happy with just that. Yeah, look, I'll get it around the track. I don't care if it's going on three cylinders. It's going to get around the tracks, trust me. <laughs> but we might have to get out and help give you a push, but anyway, we'll get there. So it will turn out to be the lap of honour I wanted to do, but I'll be actually going as fast as I can. I think that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> well, Peter Brock, uh, congratulations on everything and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you and uh, to all you out there who have supported me around Australia, for all your viewers, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Peter Brock and there is the news from the pits. We expect him to be back. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Well, it looks as though, uh, to be quite honest, I think they're going to give the Holden a bit of a heart transplant and probably put another engine in it for, for Brocky to go out, and I think that's just a tremendous thing for the HRT guys to do. OK, the lights are off on the safety car. That means we're about to resume racing in the Primus 1000 Classic, the V8s on Thunder Mountain. The light about to come back just over two hours in race distance. Safety car peels off into pit lane, and away they go. Well, at the moment it stands, Russell Ingle leads the way, and there he is. Doing a great job in the Castrol, Falc uh, Castrol Commodore. There's second place, Neil Crompton in the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore. He's one, two, three, fourth back in that queue. He was 31 seconds behind the Castrol Commodore before that safety car period. Now look where he is. Yeah, terrific effort. Top privateer at the moment. It is still Charlie Cox and Chris Mernon. They're doing a terrific job. 15 outright and top privateer. Here comes Neil Crompton. We're waiting for the Castrol Falcon to come into view as well. That's your top three. Ingle in the Castrol Commodore. Second of the Shell Forge coming through there. Left down. It seems as though uh, Seaton may have some sort of a problem because the way uh, they were talking through the, uh, the bits and pieces inside the car before, obviously he's playing with the, the sway bars to, uh, to get a balance with the car. So I hope nothing's really gone wrong with it. Here's your second place car, just slowly picking its way up through the field. Neil Crompton and Wayne Gardner. Car prepared in Sydney under enormously experienced engineer Wally Story. They've been doing a tough here for a few years, poor old Wayne. They've, they've had a, uh, they've had a, you know, a fairly good run in, in, in a lot of the races, but they've never just really made, sort of got right to the end. And, uh... well, they've always just had some bad luck towards the end. Last year they were very, very frustrated and disappointed, but nevertheless we ride now inside with thanks to Primus. Let's have a listen to Neil Crompton, hard at work inside the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore. sound for us. How loud is it in, inside the car for you with oh. your helmet on and your earplugs in? Probably about ten times worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, you know, my kids reckon I'm going deaf anyway because everything they say I just have them on anyway and I say, hey, I can't talk to you. <laughs> but the, it is very noisy inside the car and not only the, the engine noise but you certainly get a lot of gear noise from the gearbox and things like that. 
and uh, a squeal of the brakes, which is uh, with the very hard pads that uh, you have to run here at Bathurst. The Holden race score at the moment, it's Russell Ingle who leads from Neil Crompton, Scott Pruitt in third. Unbelievable, Charlie O'Brien back there in fourth, they pitted, O'Brien's doing a double stop, Jimmy Richards in fifth position, then we go back six through ten, it's Andrew Medici, Skippy Parsons, then we go back to Percy, Hossack and Poole. Primus 1000 Classic is just 60 laps old of Mount Panorama. You're watching the Ford Credit Falcon. David Parsons behind the wheel in seventh place and bad damage on the front end there. As you can see, they left the track not long ago. And honestly, they're dropping like flies here this afternoon. Quite amazing. We just lost car 21, Brian Walden and Steve Williams, VP Commodore, one of the privateer entries. Now they're lying about 35th at the time. So no major influence on the race positions here. But still, lots of things happening as Russell Ingle still leads the race from Crompton and Scotty Pruitt has won back, third place ahead of Charlie O'Brien. Let's go to John Smales. All the damage on the David Parsons Glen Seaton car is around the front end. Look at them rip off the front spoiler. Without that new front spoiler on, the car will have no downforce, it'll be able to do nothing. There is no attempt by the team to go anywhere near tyres. They're not changing any tyres at all. Parsons is in the car, simply shaking his hand in dismay. They're having a quiet look at the back of the car just to see that everything's in round and that the diff's working. 25 seconds have gone by, just tightening the front spoiler. It would appear to only be superficial damage. Hugely bad luck. Just putting a bit of race tape on the front of it, just to hold it in place. On the front left and the front right. 39 seconds down. Glenn Seaton nowhere to be seen. I think he might have even left his pit and may not even be aware that this is on. Well, I'll catch his 48 seconds to stop and David Parsons rejoins the Primus 1000. Well, Dickie didn't need that, did he? Mate, he certainly didn't. And, uh, you know, the, the worst thing you can do is go another lap down. But uh, fortunately, they've got the car back out uh, just prior to the, uh, the lead car coming around. But going back to the uh, to when they had the pace car, I cannot believe that so many of these guys. Just while you're talking there, Dick, we've got a Shell Helix replay might explain what happened there to oh, David Parsons. Oh, now he's running offline. He's going straight, straight across ahead. the grass. Yeah. Well, it's, mate, if you get into trouble there, that's the only way of going. I can assure you, because uh, the rest of it's all concrete and it hurts. <laughs> Sand on wall. Exactly. There's so little and that's clearance. where John Bauer went in there on the left. Yep. There's so little clearance. Let's look at this from another angle. He goes, oh, he locked up a brake straight ahead. And watch this crunch. There she goes. I can't believe they didn't change the tyres, to be quite honest, because uh, you know I think they wanted to have a serious flat spot on it. Have a look at this again from the back of the Castrol Commodore. So, yes, he's, he's actually missed. He's missed the apex of the corner because you've virtually got to brush that wall as you go through, and uh, he's just got into the wee bit of the marbles again. Just shows what you're saying, Dick Johnson, about how accurate you have to be around this track. Here's uh, Car 11, our race leader, coming in for what should be its second scheduled stop. 62 laps down. And this should be a pad change too, I'd say. Should be the pad change. They've got a pad change window between 30% and 70% of race distance. That means lap between lap 48 and lap 112. So this would be a good time to do it. No. Barry Sheen's on the spot. No, it's not a pad change, it's just a routine sort of tyre change and uh, Larry was just, just about finishing putting his helmet on as the uh, guys called him up and said, Ingle's in the pit lane, so uh, it was all a bit of a rush job, but knowing Larry can go with it. Very quick stop from the Castrol team, back into action, not changing tads that time, they're going to leave it till later on. I guess Dick Johnson, you look at this race situation now with Charlie O'Brien in fourth position. Ingle, Crompton and Pruitt are still yet to make their pad change. They made their pad change under, under the safety Well, exactly, car. and I think what Tony did was exactly the right thing, and I think it's going to put a, exactly play right into his hands because when you consider that, OK, it's, it puts you out of sync with your pit stops, but there is the, the chance that there may be another pace car at some other stage of the game, but I can assure you that under a yellow flag, it is much better to change your pads and come the later on in the race, if you've got a problem, or should I say, if you've got to put another stop in just for a, for a bit of fuel, it, it is a lot quicker than changing pads. Well, a very hot and sweaty Russell Engel has just stepped out of the Castrol Commodore. Let's go to Barry Sheen. Going all right, Russell. Got a nice smile on your face. Yeah, no, she's really cruising along. Like I haven't even cracked into a sweat. It's just doing it so easy. Um, yeah, I said to the boys, what do you want me to run at? They said 13.5. So I tried to stick it around that. And I said, look, if I need to go faster, just give us a yell. And 
Uh, but no, beautiful. The car's really good. Uh, I dropped off a little bit. The boys said there was oil up the top of the circuit, so I just took a cautious for a lap. But um, just then, we're a. Uh, it caught us out a bit. It just ran out of fuel in the chase. I was going through and it just went. And I thought, oh, Christ. So big panic. And I'm, I'm telling the guys, oh, we've got to come in. What do you reckon that was a panic? You should see Larry. I saw that Larry. He didn't have his helmet on. The guy said, Craig, he's coming in. <laughs> half, half his gloves and half his helmet on. Anyway, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. It's a long old race, isn't it? Thanks, Barry. You certainly is. Right, you guys. Well, Mark, I tell you, that's all. That's what Bathurst is all about, mate. When it's your day, it's your day, I tell you. Yeah, you get a cough when you're running out of fuel just when you're oh. very close to pits. That's what I mean. The sun's shining on you one day, isn't it? Well, exactly. You know, it could just as well have coughed as you, as you went through uh, the corner on the pit straight and you've got to do a whole lap wondering whether it's going to make it or not. Russell Engel. Top three finish in the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship this year. He was one of those three guys that were fighting it out for the win. Seaton, Bow, and Ingle, and of course Glenn Seaton won that. We're looking at some nice in-car shots of Larry Perkins, hard at work, courtesy of Dunlop. We've got the split there, an internal and external shot as he goes down underneath the Dunlop Bridge. Just caught up the combination of Williams and Gover going across the track into pit lane. We have Pruitt in the pits. Scott Pruitt is in. They're going for a change. Now, will they do their pad change here? No. John Smiles. So I'm on, yes, I'm on the stop at the moment. No attempt to do the pad change. Interestingly, Alan Jones has come back out to get in the car, not suggesting that he'll put Jason Bright anywhere near it. Jones looking pretty fit, in fact, and saying that he's feeling right up to the task. And with the amount of dropouts that are occurring, looking pretty good for a race winner. And that's a good thing to get a driver uh, thinking positively about his mental health. Jones got in the car. Well, with the way this is, however, a long stop, Lee. It's gone 37 seconds so far. Difficulty getting the driver actually into his belts. Gee, they've been there a long time, John. Certainly have. We're over 45 seconds now. The car's ready to go, but it's all now. The mechanics jumped in the left-hand side just to help with the belts. And that stop was 51 seconds, just for fuel, just for tyres. Too long a stop. You cannot afford to have those sort of pit stops. If you're going to win this race, you've got to be in and out of the pits in 20 seconds or less. I was going to say, that's effectively cost them half a minute in the pits, hasn't it? Well, I can assure you that picking up 30 seconds on the road is an impossible task. This is such a competitive class. Here's your new race leader. It's Neil Crompton in the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore. They'd be over the moon. Wally Story and the gang down there in the pit garage would be very, very happy with the way things are going. Wayne Gardner, things are looking good at the moment. They'd be very happy right at that spot there that we just saw Wayne smacked the wall very hard yesterday in the top 10 shootout but he was okay and it was just a little bit of superficial damage to the car they both worked hard they worked very well as a team in unison as setting up this car they have to make very little changes when they actually make the driver change and uh, it's working to their advantage at the moment Crompton and Gardner leading the way now there's Gardner standing by so expect Neil Crompton in, in the next lap or so well they're getting good mileage too 64 laps Paul Gardner steps in for his second stint. They're doing a terrific job here. Well, 64 laps, Mark, is about the right uh, sink for the uh, for the pit stops. It's interesting to see that Craig is uh, is matching uh, Prompton one for one here. He's uh, he's going well. He's time for in the, in the mid 14s, which is about the race pace. So Neil Crompton brings it across the top of Mount Panorama. Tyres ready, Wayne Gardner ready in pit lane. So he brings it down the other side of the hill this time around. Enjoying a 31 second lead over Charlie O'Brien in the Castrol Falcon. And we just to see if they go for their pad change now. I guess Dick, um, a, pad change is a, a pad change is a potentially messy and disastrous thing. Do you want to get that out of the way as soon as you can? Well, there is a window. It's got to be somewhere between uh, lap 48 and I think it's around about lap 112 or thereabouts. So, it, yeah. uh, so you've only got two opportunities as long as you don't get out of sync with your pit stops. And this is why I cannot understand why they did not do that when the pace car came out. Because, OK, it's easier to put a little bit of fuel in the car to get to the finish and a little bit of a splash and dash, as they call it, but uh, not to do something that sort of can go wrong as easily as a pad change under a yellow flag. Uh, amazing. Yeah. We go on board with Neil Crompton at the moment. Pictures courtesy of Primus sweeping through the Caltex chase. 
will stay on this shot. Let's see if Crompton does in fact come in this lap. I think they will because Gardner was standing by, helmet on, full gear on, ready to go. They come under the Dunlop Bridge, Neil sticking to the left-hand side. No, he doesn't. Doesn't go into pit lane. So perhaps one more lap before the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore comes in. I think they'll be looking towards uh, just getting it on the reserve on the fuel so they can get the, the most laps they possibly can in just in case something goes wrong towards the end of the event. Well, they've got a, uh, a good little buffer over Charlie O'Brien in the Castrol Ford. Keep in mind, Charlie is doing a double stint. They've stopped, they've made their change, and or rather they've come into the pits, and Charlie stayed in the car. He's doing a double stint. They've also made their pad change. That's a critical thing, too. It could be a very critical thing later in the races. Dick Johnson says you come in for a splash and dash, but you just need to put a little bit of fuel in it. They haven't got to worry about a, a pad change. Some of the things that uh, Crompton's doing now, I would suggest the way he was adjusting a few things there, would suggest that he's going to pull into the pits this lap. So we're on board, the uh, Wayne Gardner Racing Commodore, and it's busier than Pit Street in the rush hour here. Well, there's three seconds gone off your time, that's for sure. Crompton just backing off a little bit, making sure he got through that traffic nice and cleanly. See the bugs all over the screen. I was due for a pit stop very, very shortly. Well, he takes this race extremely seriously as we have a look at the Levi's race score. The combination of Gardner and Crompton, Crompton behind the wheel, leads the way from Longhurst and O'Brien. Richards and Richards, that's a great effort by the two Fantastic. Richos. We go back five through eight, Larkin, Madigi, Jones, Pruitt, they've fallen back a bit because of that slow pit stop. Faulkner, Percy and Poole and Scott. Hossack and Ellery, they're doing quite well. Ashby, Reed, Romano and Grice up into 11th. That's a terrific effort and Crick and Fitzgerald sitting in 12th. Coca-Cola Commodores. Neil Crompton points it down Conrod straight once again. The seven-year-old from Ballarat, Victoria, now lives up in Belrose in Sydney, having a tremendous season in the North American Touring Car Championship this year. Now, when you when you see this, when uh, when the Gardner car pulls into the pits, uh, Longhurst, Crompton, uh, Longhurst and O'Brien uh, car will take over the lead, and you'll see why it is so important to have done your pad stop there and then, because if they elect to do their pad stop now, they're going to lose a fair bit of time on uh, on Longhurst and O'Brien. So it's one of those situations. They're going fast again. So even though Wayne Gardner's standing there in the pits ready, this is lap 65, this will be lap 66, as Neil Crompton trips the transponder in his car to clock up another lap. Well, he's got a reasonable buffer. He's got 31 seconds over Charlie at the moment. Well, that, that was a 2.16, so it just shows you how much time you can actually lose on, when you catch some slower cars up around the top of the mountain. Well, he has tasted victory at before Neil Crompton at Bathurst. He was first in the 12-hour production car race up here in 1994, sharing a Mazda with the late and very great Greg Hansford. But he hasn't won the race for V8s, and that's the one he really wants. I guess that's the one every racing driver wants, Nick, before you retire. Oh, most definitely. It's, it's, a, it's an experience that uh, very few have had the privilege of winning this event, and uh, I'm going to assure you it's a great thrill. He's had two thirds in 92 and 95. He said he's sick of it. He wants to get up there to that number one spot and just engage in that special feeling and experience that special, that special feeling of winning here at Bathurst after 1,000 grueling kilometres. Surely he must be coming in this lap. He must be getting very close indeed. See how hard he's pushing that car, the great low-level shot through McPhillamy Park there. You can see one, sometimes two wheels on the inside of the car get up in the air. Car on maximum cornering load through there, down through the S's toward the dipper. Neil Crompton will be talking to his team manager, chief engineer Wally Storey. It's incredible when you see where the times have gone back to now, isn't it? Like, uh, starting at the early stages of uh, when it's very, very cool this morning at 10 o'clock and they were running in the 12s and 13s. Now they're back to 14s and 15s, so uh, I think you'll find that towards the end of the day when it gets cooler again, those times will start to come back down. Larkham the quickest last time round with a uh, 2.14.7, some two seconds quicker than the front runners. so here we come one more time through the Caltex chase into the left-hander. Neil Crompton just coming up on the inside of the Wayne Russell rickshaw combination there. Do we see the Coca-Cola Donut King Commodore come in this time round? I think we do. It's slowing down. Yes. In comes Neil Crompton. Wayne Gardner will be jumping into the car. Whoa! Craig Baird. Craig Baird. You can hear the crowd cheering. Bit of a tyre squeal. He's lost it. Coming onto pit straight. Fortunately, no damage done. 
back in the race. He's away again. Race leader Neil Crompton is coming down pit lane there. He's in pit lane and the pit stop has already started. John Smales is on the spot. John, are they going for pads? Yes, they are. Mark, indeed they are. Now, in a unique car, this Donut King Coca-Cola Commodore, because as you can see, it has twin calipers on the front brakes. A leading one and a trailing one. That's a Wally Story invention made to make sure that this car is easy on brakes. But the rules state that they only have to change one set of brake pads, so as you can see, they just changed the trailing edge brake pads. And this is a ripper stop held up a little bit by the front left-hand side of the car. New driver, all four tyres, full fuel and brake pads in 38 seconds. That's very good, Dick. It certainly is a very good stop. Anything under 40 seconds is a good stop for brake pads, but he's still pumping the brakes up. Now, that is something that I can assure you that we will not leave the pit until such time as that brake pedal is like a brick. <laughs> That's what happened at Sandia. Not the sort of place you want to drive around without brakes. Gardner rejoins in fifth position. So Charlie O'Brien will take over the lead at the Primus 1000 Classic, the Castrol Falcon. Don't forget those guys have come from 39th position this morning to lead the race. Unbelievable. Well, they've done their stop too. The story just keeps getting better here at Mount Panorama. There is your new lead car, the 25 Castrol Ford. We'll be back on the other side of this. Welcome back to another car. After 68 laps of the Primus another car bites the dust at the uh, Primus 1000 Classic and unfortunately it was a premature end for Peter Brock. He has promised to make it back a little later and give the crowd a chance to say farewell. This is the 23 car hitting very hard. It looks as though Briggs and Hislop may be out of the race. Well, they're certainly stuck for now. We'll see if they can get back into it. Now we're going to check in on our Holden banner competition. This is banner number one for you and this is your chance at home to win. All you've got to do is select our best banner out of the four that our commentators have picked. Here's banner number one and the number 1902 550 636. 1902 550 636. If you think that's the best banner, ring that line later. You could be in for a lucky, lucky prize at the end of it. This is banner number two, the King of the Bathurst. Not a bad sign on Peter Brock. The number for you there, 1902 550 637. 1902 550 637. These are the first two of four banners that we have selected our 10 commentary team. And at the end of the, the day's actions, we will be picking the final banner. And if you match it, you could win this at home, a $40,000 Holden SS Commodore, a terrific piece of motor vehicle. It's a VT, it's a V8 straight off the production line, a magnificent motor car. As we say farewell to Peter Brock, and we are inside the 100 lap mark of the big race. And that's the reason why the safety car is out on the track. The all-rookie team, the all-Tasmanian team of Ray Hislop, the EF Falcon. Ray Hislop racing, he's 33 years old, and I think that's the end of his Bathurst in 1997. Here's another look at how it happened, and it's so often happened today at Mount Panorama. Into the wall, out of the Primus 1000 Classic. And great disappointment there for Ray and his teammate, his co-driver, 25-year-old Tim Briggs from Penguin all the way in Tasmania, 1995 Tasmanian Rookie of the Year, Timmy Briggs, but his lot behind the wheel when the car left, and that face says it all. Charlie O'Brien has the Longhurst Falcon in the lead in the Primus 1000 Classic, and that would absolutely smash all kinds of records. The worst starting position for a winning car was in fact the Dick Johnson, John Bauer victory in 1994. They started from 10th on the grid. Peter Brock had a winning car, 20th on the grid in 1987, but that was in fact his second car. He started the race from pole and then swapped cars during the race. So Dick and John actually hold that record, starting from 10th on the grid and winning in that same car. If Longhurst and O'Brien can get this Castrol Falcon home today from 39th on the grid, it will be an absolutely amazing record to top. Stephen Richards in second place at the moment, Larry Perkins in third, but as we said, the pace car out and plenty of action ahead in the Primus 1000 Classic. What an amazing story, there they are, from 39th to 1st, the two Queenslanders, the two guys from the Gold Coast, Charlie O'Brien behind the wheel doing a double stint, doing it tough and he's coming into the pits. They... Uh, smart move, I think he flat spotted that tyre pretty badly in the, in the chase there, uh, just a few laps before the pace car came in. 
Well, you were saying to us in the break, Dick, you saw that big brake lock up, which our viewers weren't privy to, but it probably put a big flat spot on the tyre, and this is the best time to go and change it. Oh, most definitely, because, uh, you know, you don't lose any time. He really should have, uh, when the pace car went out, and without even catching up to the pace car, he should have come straight in the pits then, and then he wouldn't have to join the end of the line. But at this point in time, he'll have to go back and he'll be right on the end of the line. And Charlie looks as though he's still staying in the car. Tony obviously wants to go fishing or something. <laughs> Charlie was always going to do a double stint, so I guess he hasn't got quite to the end of his time. Do a double stint, so I guess he hasn't got quite to the end of his time. Barry Sheen. Yeah, I've spoken to Tony Longhurst and uh, Tony said they decided to bring him in. Um, just give him a bit of extra fuel so they give him a big, bigger window of opportunity at the end. Hang on a second. Tony, why did you bring him in? Um, we were about 10 laps down on being able to do the race with only, uh, what are we, two more stops. So we thought at the end we might have had to have a churn. But now we've got a full tank of gas. We can get out. Uh, we, we just got it right back on pace. We're, we don't have to change brake pads. All we've got to do now is have two more stops. I'll get in the car at the next stop and then we'll come in later on for another set of tyres and fuel and I'll finish the race. So, uh, looking pretty good. I was going to say, why aren't you in the car? I mean, he's been out there all day long, hasn't he? I let him have a bit of a drive. I didn't give him much in practice, so <laughs> it's nice having a rest. Great, thanks, Tony. Thank you. Tony Longhurst looking pretty happy with things and uh, why shouldn't he? They're in a strong position. Well, they've just uh, handed over the lead of the race to the Richards and Richards combination. Father and son, Stephen and Jim, and they're in a very good position. And there's Charlie just coming onto the back of that line. It's a replay of an earlier incident. We go to a very high shot there. This Whoa. is a Romano Grice entry. That looked like coming through the Castrol chase. And that thing almost tipped. That's the place you're going to go to falling over, that's for sure. Shell Hillix replay. Great shot there of Romano, getting it back on its wheels, fortunately. Just had a couple of cars come to grief down there. Might have a look at that on another angle. Just a moment. On our replay. Same angle, just a little bit earlier. Romano coming around the outside. And contact there, just yep. Whoa. Flipped the tyre, the back tyre of the other vehicle, and uh, boy, it all happens, doesn't it? So fortunately, looks like he got back onto the track. Bill Woods. Well, that's the reason the safety car is out on the track, although that is not, in fact, the reason. that They're taking the opportunity now to take away the Murphy Lounge HRT Commodore, which was parked up there on the top quite some time ago. But it was the car 23, the EF Falcon of Ray Hislop, that has uh, caused the safety car to come out as the Castrol Cougars take the chance to change pads. And we'll take the opportunity to take another break here from the Primus 1000 Classic at Mount Panorama. 1000 Classic Update, brought to you by Armoral. Moving into the third hour of the Primus 1000 Classic, and who would have thought that the Mobile Holden Racing Team's day would have just ended like this. This is Mark Scave in the 05 Commodore. It was forced out as Peter Brock's hopes of a 10th Bathurst title went with it. And as you can see, smoke coming in there, a flame out in the airbox. Scaife was left powerless, and that's the sign. That's the story of the day. Peter Brock, we will miss you. Now, of course, the safety car did come out during the last hour that's just gone by, and it came out because of a rather unique little spin between Mark Larkin and John Cotter. As they made it down towards the bottom of the track, they decided to do a bit of a tango in unison. A little bit of a duel, and Cotter's car ending up in the dirt, but Mark Larkin's car quite okay, spinning side by side the two cars. Up on top of the mountain though, the Glen Seaton car with David Parsons aboard had to go back into the pits with front end damage. That occurred as Parsons just went spinning across straight into the sand and on impact, all the front fender just went mangled as it went down. Larry Perkins' car, Russell Ingle, took the lead after the 05's exit and Larry Perkins is now in the car after a rather smooth change. That's the number 11 Castrol car. Neil Crompton enjoying an incident-free race in the Donut King Coke Commodore with Wayne Gardner. They are out in front ahead of Charlie O'Brien, but this is just what happened. The number 23 car of Ray Hislop, well, his race is over. Exciting stuff at the Primus 1000. Still under the safety car as we view the Primus 1000 Classic from the air, but the lights are off, so we'll be underway shortly. And Stephen Richards, the all Richards team, inherits the lead. Perkins second, Gardner third, but they've made a very intelligent pit stop, so we'll see what happens there. Larkham and O'Brien make up the top five. 
We've said goodbye to Dick Johnson in the commentary position and thank him very much for an entertaining afternoon. But we have a new guest right now, so we'll go back up top with Mark Oster and Lee Diffie. Yeah, we're joined by uh, Scott Pruitt. Scott, did you enjoy your stint out there? You went very well. You're running very consistent times. Yeah, things went pretty good. Biggest, <clears throat> biggest thing was, uh, you know, getting more familiar with the car and uh, watching out for traffic because there's a lot going on out there and you really got to keep your nose clean. How are you physically? Are you a little bit tired or fitness is not a problem? No, that's um, actually these cars are quite easy to drive um, from a physical standpoint, but uh, you got to know where they're going. There's a lot of body roll with them compared to the Indy car. Um, there's a lot of pitch when you go up underneath braking, uh, so you, you really got to get used to that. And thinking that you know an Indy car weighs 1,500 pounds and these things weigh 3,000 pounds, almost twice the amount of weight and less tires. So it, you really got to you really got to plan ahead. Here's our race leader, Stephen Richards in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. Larry Perkins and the Castro Commodore behind him. Then it's Gardner, Larkham O'Brien, Alan Jones back in the Komatsu Ford. Tremendous queue of cars here. There's Father Jim Richards watching his very talented son at the wheel leading the Primus 1000 Classic across the top of the mountain. Well, what do you reckon, Jimmy? Are you pretty happy at the moment? I think he can hear <laughs> us down there. The roar of all those V8s coming past, <laughs> he wouldn't be able to hear a thing, but uh, he's certainly watching on with interest and no doubt a great deal of pride. This guy really is a chip off the old block, isn't he? Jimmy Richards, one of the most talented racing drivers in the country I think the world's ever seen, turns 50 this year. And this is his son, just only in his 20s, and a long and surely sparkling career ahead of him. Hasn't this race closed up beautifully? The top three sitting right there on your screen. Stephen Richards in the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. Then we go back to Larry Perkins and Wayne Gardner starting to haul him in. And uh, I guess, Scott, you'd be, you guys would be happy just to still be out there. Jones, he's got himself up back up into sixth position. And uh, especially after what's happened today, we've seen so many bad accidents. Yeah, it's, it, it's really unfortunate, too, because uh, this race is one Oops. of those... Oops. Going up the inside, is that, uh, that Gardner? Is the Coca-Cola Commodore, Wayne Gardner, yep. getting on the attack very, very early. Took that opportunity to slide up the inside of the Castro Commodore. He moves up to second position, push Larry Perkins back one position. We also have a fight between tire manufacturers. You have to remember uh, the Gardner cars on Dunlops. <coughs> um, the car that, that you just got by is, uh, is on Dunlops, uh, but the car in front, I believe, is, is on Bridgestones right now, and you really got to have that consistency. Uh, as, as a driver, you know, you really depend on the car, and right now, we're, we're, you know, you're just putting the miles in. You need to run hard, you need to run strong, uh, and just keep it going. Well, it was a great tire battle here, Scott Pruitt. The car in front's on Bridgestones, the second place car on Yokohama, third place car on Dunlops. So it's a real tire battle amongst these teams. We saw that uh, driver change you had with Alan. It seemed to go on for quite a long time. Did you have difficulty changing in that stop? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it just it just didn't go smooth at all. Um, it really hurt us a lot because I think we brought the car in uh, th third or fourth, I believe, and uh, unfortunately lost a lot of valuable time, as well as not uh, we had really wanted to come in on that yellow right at the end of that yellow, uh, and unfortunately we just we just couldn't get it done. So uh, we lost a bit of time there. So now we're now we're playing catch up. Well, there's your sister car, the Minor 10 Falcon, with Mark Larkham behind the wheel and Larko would be wrapped at the moment because they're sitting in fourth position ahead of Charlie O'Brien. Then we go back to Alan Jones, John Faulkner, Mark Poole, Trevor Ashby and Glenn Seaton back in tenth position but Larkham he's going well in the minor 10 Falcon sitting in fourth and there's Charlie O'Brien right behind so we've got some really good close battles happening at the moment in the top five. That's the beauty of the safety car I guess Scott for it because even though you had those problems in the driver change the cars come out put you all in a queue and it's let you make up a lot of very valuable ground. Yeah it does and that's one thing real interesting about this track you have to remember it's uh well four miles are how many kilometers six eight kilometers six point two kilometers, 6 .2 kilometers, kilometers. so if you're running good you're not going to be lapped um and, and the beauty of it is is if there is a yellow and, you, and we know there is going to be yellow in, in six and a half to seven hours of racing uh, we know that's going to happen it's going to bunch everything back up well to you a, a safety car and a pace car situation is is nothing strange to these guys when they run their three races per round of a shell australian touring car round they very rarely get to see a pace car situation here and at Sandown. The two Enduros are the two places they get to see that safety car situation. As Gardner closes right up on the back of Stephen Richards now, this is getting really exciting, Barry Sheen. 
quite incredible. I stand here with Jim. Jim, when little Stephen was born, did you ever think you'd be leading Bathurst with him? No, I probably didn't really, but uh, I suppose all dads hope their sons are going to follow in the, whatever sport they're in, and it's great uh, that we're here, but the race is only half over. <laughs> yeah, he's um, Gardner's right up behind him now. What do you reckon? Yeah, I think he'll just let Wayne go. If Wayne's travelling faster, then it's no sense in trying to hold the guy up with the race only half over. No problems with the car? No, the car's going great. Uh, have you spoken to Stephen? Uh, has uh, Stephen spoken to the pits lately? No, I haven't. Uh, he only speaks if there's something wrong and he hasn't spoken. <laughs> That's good. It's silence is gold. <laughs> exactly right. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Baz. I think that works on the theory of no news is good news when you're in the middle of a race like this, but not even a half distance yet, lap 74. He brings up an interesting point, and I'm not sure a lot of view viewers uh, really understand. He says, let him go. Because this race is so long, if one of the cars is running, the combination of driver and car is running quicker than you are, uh, the opportunity, you don't want to let him go, but you may take a chance on him him, him making a, a pretty bold move and taking you both out of the race. We've seen a number of times within the IndyCar ranks, um, and, and especially like running Daytona and some of the other races I've won around over the years. Um, so sometimes it is, I mean, it didn't seem like you should let him go, but but in but in talking about finishing the race and doing uh, doing what you can, you, it might be in your best interest to let him go. Just oh. take it easy and operate wisely. That's exactly what Stephen Richards is doing at the moment. They're sitting pretty, the two Richos. The best ever father and son combination here on the mountain was set in 1991 where Alf and Tim Grant finished sixth. So uh, Jim and Stephen are looking uh, a little bit better than that at the moment. Well, how close and tough do you like it? Stephen Richards leading the race. Just in behind him, Wayne Gardner, the 1987 World 500cc champion, really wants his first Bathurst win under his belt. Larry Perkins right behind in the Castrol Commodore. And it's Mark Larkham, Charlie O'Brien, the Castrol Falcon, and Wayne Gardner sneaks up the inside of the Valvoline Commodore. He goes through to take the lead of the Primus 1000 Classic at Mount Panorama. You see when they were coming down Conrad Strait, Gardner just gave a quick flash of the lights. Yep, yep. I'm coming on through, Stevie. Nope, yeah, watch out. <laughs> It'd be a little incident. And that's, and that's one of those things, even though you're running in the lead sometimes like I said earlier sometimes it just makes sense to let this guy go I mean, he could have closed the door and I'm taking both out of the race and, and that would have been uh, not so good but uh, as, as at B you hear he's running second it's a real real boost to his spirits Wayne Gardner you're riding with the world champ open face helmet on in the car cockpit temperatures in these cars someone exceeding 50 55 degrees centigrade really is a hot box got for what I imagine. <laughs> it is. Um, fortunately, we, we have about, uh, you know, we have a lot of air just about a, a hand away, you know, right about the helmet height. And these cars, they do get very high. They do get very hot. I was out there uh, during my stint uh, in the Conrad Jupiter's Commodore. I was uh, I was getting around there and, and, and you notice the temperature from the engine compartment. Uh, a little bit hotter and, and a lot less airflow than an Indy car. Find it more interesting being up higher too. A little bit bizarre. Well, you know, it's not the height as much as the roll. I mean, these cars will really roll over. If you watch uh, in some of the shots here, you'll, you'll notice them really rolling over, especially there down through there. Uh, I think that's Skyline. <clears throat> a lot of roll in the car, enough to where it picks up the front front tire. We don't do any of that with the car ranks. I mean, if you look at these guys, probably have you know somewhere around 13, 1400 pound front springs, five, 600 pound rear springs, and uh, we'll be running somewhere about 3,000 fronts and uh, 15, 1800 pound rear. So it's a big difference, especially since we're half the weight of them. <laughs> yeah. Wayne Gardner leads him down the hill, down to Forest Elbow once again. Lights on for Stephen Richards and the Valvoline Cummins Commodore. These guys picking their way through slower traffic. Harry Perkins just sitting behind there in third position. How's the traffic been, Scott? We've heard some complaints from some other drivers. Some of the uh, slower cars have been a bit difficult to pass. It's a bit of a nightmare out there. Y yes, it is. Some some have been very, very good. Um, we'll really get out of your way. Point point which side they want you to go on. And, and other guys just seem like they're holding on. They're even looking in their mirrors, and it's a bit uh, bit of a struggle getting by. Here's Stevie. He's under siege again. Stephen Richards, that is. Larry Perkins in the Castrol Commodore. Bridging that gap, forcing hard for that second position. Stephen's done really, really well. He's sitting in second at the moment, but here comes Larry. We go back, Larkham sitting in fourth and O'Brien in fifth. Alan Jones still remains in sixth position on lap 76, coming up towards the three hour mark. Yeah, just 15 seconds away from three hours. In the Primus 1000 Classic, Wayne Gardner leading from Stephen Richards, coming under increasing fire from Larry Perkins in the Castro Commodore. Doing times, well, Wayne Gardner's just pulled out an absolute blinder, a 2 minute 12.9 second lap. 
He really wants to open the gap on his pursuers, and that's a very quick time for this time of the race. Let's not get too carried away, but if Gardner and Crompton can hang on, this would just be just such a boost for their confidence. Wayne, at times, has been so frustrated and saying, look, I can drive these damn things, but there's just been circumstances that have worked against me. As we have a look at a great battle happening here, Alan Jones is closing right up on fellow Gold Coaster in Charlie O'Brien, right in front. Then we go up to another Gold Coast resident in Mark Larkham in the Mitre 10 Falcon, John Smiles. I have with me Alan Horsley, the team manager for Stephen Johnson. Bad luck to Stephen, he's been called in. Why? Uh, we believe it's because he passed a car before he got to the start-finish line after the pace car restart. But I'm not real sure, but I think that's what it is. So the officials came to you and told you what? That we had a stop-start penalty. How, long, how much does it cost you? Huh? Oh, it'll cost us about 25 seconds. Frustrating. Yeah, very frustrating when we're trying to get back a lap or two. Thank you. Well, Scotty Fruitt just had to step out of the commentary box during that cross to Alan Horsley. He's getting ready. He's going to do another stint in the Komatsu Conrad Jupiter's Falcon, which is locked up in this tremendous battle with his teammate Alan Jones as he tries to hunt down Charlie O'Brien. This is the battle for fifth and sixth position. Few uh, movers back there towards the back half of the top ten. John Faulkner is in seventh position. He's going very well. Len Seaton's come up a couple. He's in eighth. Trevor Ashby in the Lansvale Smash Repairs car is running a brilliant ninth position. And Mark Poole is running in tenth. The top privateer, Chris Smurden, running in eleventh. And that's outstanding when you consider there's 41 cars in this field, or 40 as of uh, Barguana's exit this morning. That's terrific. Top privateer just outside the top ten. Check them out on the Levi's score board and there's a real challenge you can see there on the screen Alan Jones getting really aggressive here he'll get on the outside of the Castrol Ford they'll go side by side into Murray's corner but Charlie O'Brien has the ideal line into that turn he'll lead the Komatsu Ford onto the pit straight once again this is a great battle well, we're only on lap 77. There's still plenty of time left. Jones on the inside of O'Brien, and he's got him. Good work there by Alan Jones. Charlie uh, didn't really force the issue with AJ. Let, let him come on through. So now Jones moves up into the top five. O'Brien back to sixth, and the Fords are going very strong. Tell you what, that Coca-Cola Commodore is looking good no matter what the condition. Full tanks, half tanks, empty tanks to do a 2.12.9. On lap 77, but everyone around you running to the 13s and 14s, that's exceptional. He must have got a nice clear lap, but it shows there's plenty of speed left in that car for our race leader, Wayne Gardner. Well, he's only two tenths slower on that last lap, 2.13.11, so he's going extremely well. It's Wayne Gardner, and that shot there illustrated the point beautifully. There's another great shot. He's just streaking away from Stephen Richards, who's still under siege from Larry Perkins. The action is really starting to hot up here. Let's have a look at your top ten. It's Gardner, leads Stevie Richards. Larry Perkins, then we go back to Mark Larkham and Charlie O'Brien still in the Castrol Ford. Sixth is Jones, then we go back to Faulkner, Seaton, Ashby and Poole. More after this break.